From pocketnow.com, this is Pocket Now Weekly. Hello, and welcome to episode 025 of the Pocket Now Weekly, the first podcast of 2013 in a series from pocketnow.com, where we discuss the awesome and the awful in the world of mobile technology, from Windows to Android to iPhone and everything in between. I'm your host, Michael Fisher, senior editor at Pocket Now, and I'm joined by the man with the bronze iPad Mini, as will become your new title, I think, Brandon Miniman. Good day to you, sir. Good day. And by the man from Utah, Joe Levi, the Android guy. How are you today? Absolutely fantastic. I am pleased to hear that. We had a very, very minimum amount of uh, pre-podcast chatter today, so I actually know nothing about how you guys are standing in in the world, and I would love to know, Joe, how your uh, how your New Year's was. Oh, New Year's was fantastic. I, I actually made it up past midnight this year. Yes, Did playing you know? Settlers of Catan. Oh, that's awesome. That's such a fun game. <laughs> Did you have uh, you have some people over the over the household, or was it a family only affair? No, we went over to uh, our friend and neighbor's house. Uh, our kids and their kids spent all evening watching. Just horribly terrible kid shows. Most of them had Barbie princesses of some sort in them. As they should. And uh, mm-hmm. the grown-ups tried to keep ourselves caffeinated so we could stay awake and not make <laughs> stupid mistakes laying road on settlers. <laughs> uh, first, I, I absolutely adore that game, and I think that's an awesome thing to do on New Year's Eve. And second of all, I, uh, I used to make fun of my parents something fierce when they couldn't make it to midnight on New Year's Eve. I was just so... I was so outraged that anyone would would not want to see the the actual thing. Do you, do you remember you like the, you know the New York City ball drop? Did you watch that this year, either of you? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's what we do all all the time. But uh, remember, I'm in Utah, so we watch it at ten o'clock, and that's good enough. We can go to bed after that. Oh, uh-huh, lucky you. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> I used to think when I was a kid, when I first like heard about the ball dropping, I used to think it was like they would. I, and I'm being serious. I'm not being funny. This is what I thought. I thought they would get a really um, strong baseball pitcher to like grab the to grab a baseball and there was like a big ceremony at a baseball stadium and he would throw the ball into the air and he was so strong that it would take a year to come down. That's how I thought the new year was rung in, like legitimately when I was like 4. Did you not have television? No, I I don't I I guess I didn't watch it enough. I was I was busy getting all the wrong messages from Sesame Street. I was busy like telling people off and Oscar the Grouch quotes. So I I don't know. <laughs> it's just amazing. I mean, we, I haven't watched the ball drop in New York City in years now. Because uh, I've been too busy, or we just haven't planned the evening right. What did you do, Brandon? I didn't do that much. I watched I watched a lot of movies in the last week or two. One of which was Pitch Perfect. Have you guys seen that? No. What's that about? It's about it? aca- acapella groups. Oh yeah, Glee the movie. That's right. Is that what <laughs> is that what people call it? Yeah, it's uh, it's such an awesome flick if you like music at all, and it's got. Um, some pretty good actors in it. It's just a really good movie. I feel like you told me about that before, and I need to put that aside. I need to put that on my watch list. You want to watch that in Vegas? Uh, I don't think we'll have time. And it's like, we won't have time, and I just saw it four days ago. You're, you're high. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, we, if there's any video watching, it's going to be us editing our coverage and uploading right. it to YouTube. <laughs> that's right. And we're going to have Jaime Rivera with us, so we're not going to be able to watch The Pocket Now Daily like Tony and I did in, in Berlin. Um, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, we will just uh, incidentally, since uh, CES is coming up next week, we will be uh, podcasting live from CES. I believe uh, just once, but it's going to be a lot of fun, and we'll be in the same hotel room, and it'll be it'll be nice. So that'll be look forward to that. Yeah, uh, and and this year we aim to be. I mean, in, in every trade show we attend, we try to be video heavy so we can actually show you stuff and do comparisons. But this year, we're, we're, we're taking it up a notch. We've got uh, three people on the ground, which is uh, more than we've ever had. And uh, we're going to have a lot of comparisons, a lot of hands-on, a lot of Michael, a lot of me, a lot of Jaime. And uh, so the, the best thing you can do, actually, is subscribe to our YouTube channel because there's going to be a delay from when we upload the videos to when they hit Pocket Now. Because we on Pocket Now, we have to write them up, put a nice image and so forth on YouTube. It's just, boom, it's there, mm-hmm. ready to go. Mm-hmm. Go light on, on, on my content uh, until then so you don't get tired of me. But that won't be too hard because I feel like we've been in kind of a this, this post-holiday content trough for a minute. Like it's amazing to see how slow the news feeds have been have been moving in comparison to how they were before the holidays. I feel like, I I feel like like Y two K happened 
you know, and this, this, <laughs> now it's just this kind of like desolate landscape with the occasional like leak and stuff. But there's a couple things going on, but it's the incubation period. This is when all the good ideas happen because everybody's at home with their family back in the real life, and, and right. they get to see how it's, product it, X, Y, or Z could make this better, and then they go back with a renewed fervor. You know, it's so true. I actually there there are at least two editorial ideas that I've one of which I've already written, and the second one is coming up tomorrow. That. Um, that sprung directly from my time with the family over the holiday and watching kind of normal people interact with technology and not just normal people but older normal people. I feel like those are some of my favorite pieces to write because they reground me back in this, back in the real world instead of this world where all us geeks know all the gestures and why are you know why don't normal people know this you know so yeah it's it's good to get out there for some perspective. In fact, yesterday. Um, what some don't know is that back in college, I had this sort of side job business thing where I would help senior citizens with their computers. And, really? um, and, and I still have a couple of remaining clients. And I saw one yesterday. She got a new iMac, one of those really thin ones. And it was amazing. to you know the, It's amazing hardware. Um, but something strange happened. Uh, she needed Microsoft Word. And she didn't want PowerPoint or Excel. So uh, every few years, I think I do the same search on Google. How to buy just Word. <laughs> you you can't. So you have to pay $120 for for uh, for Excel, PowerPoint, and Word. And then I'm looking in the Mac App Store where Pages or yeah, Pages is $19. Mm-hmm. And I don't understand how Microsoft could still have this model. I guess because boneheads like me still uh, cough up 120 bucks for one uh, piece of software. Right. But it's just such a broken model that Microsoft has. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, fortunately, I don't have to deal with much uh, on-device word processing because my needs are not that great. But I do. I did have an app purchase experience, though, recently as a result of some advice my roommate gave me. And you guys may have heard of this before, and I'm sure tons of listeners have. But uh, I am not uh, much of an iPhone or iPad gamer. I'm not much of a mobile gamer at all. But I was faced with glowing reviews from my roommate and friend, Bob, who informed me that I absolutely must buy this game called The Room. Have you guys heard oh, of it? Oh, that's so funny. I just finished The Room a few, few weeks ago. Really? But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's iOS only, right? I, I, can't, I can't confirm that, but I do, I do think it's, it's the truth. Um, and I don't generally like puzzle games. You know, I'm, I'm not really a, a big puzzle guy, but this is so well done, and it's so creepy. The atmosphere is so t- unique, um, and the, the graphics are just so beautiful. And it, it's so nice. It, and it's challenging in just the right way without being frustrating. And there's enough hints if you get stuck. It's, it's really what, – what was it, Brandon? Was it four ninety nine or something like that? Uh, yeah, it was around there. Did you find yourself using the hints often or did you get by without them? I started off with this really noble idea that I wouldn't use any hints. And yeah, me too. <laughs> and then about, I think about 45 minutes into the game, I was like, you know what? These are actually quite helpful and I'm just going to get frustrated without them. So I, I don't think anyone could actually play the game without the hints. And did you get to the end? I have not. I'm actually not even probably halfway through. How long did it take you to, to play all the way through this awesome it's, puzzle It's game? really not that long. You know, there's a box within a box within a box, and then there's another box. There's there's like three boxes, maybe four. Right. And uh, it, it doesn't take that long, probably about five hours of gameplay. Oh, that's, you know, then I'm going to save it. And, and listeners, I mean, I don't often advocate games, but uh, you, you just need to look at the reviews for this one. I think there's something like 45,000 reviews, and it's almost... A perfect five star rating, and uh, a little hint: um, if you can play it on, if they have an iPhone version and then the, the iPad version. Play it on the iPad three. I played it on the iPad mini, and it, there's too many. There were too many jaggy ed- edges, and then I went and played it on the iPad three. I'm like, wow, this is unbelievable. Oh, it's made for that Retina display. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's see if we can. Um, let's see how how Joe Levi's doing. Are we still absent, Joe? Uh, little patches of silence, but that point I can pick up most. Of the he has switched to AM sound quality. <laughs> yeah. I decided uh, 802.11n was just too much, so I'm going back to 802.11b. Is that what you sound like you're calling from a, uh, a cell phone somewhere in the, in the, in the Sahara? Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Mm, there mm-hmm. we go. Now it's clear. That's much better. Oh, okay. That's bizarre. It's a Bermuda Triangle of Utah today. Uh, okay, so we've got, we've got Joe Levi back after a little bit of an audio issue, and we need to jump into news, and surprisingly... Incredibly, um, there's a lot of new platform news out this week. Like, I guess this holiday season was the season for all these 
nascent platforms to come out of the woodwork and say, hey, we've been working for a while and we've got something beautiful to show you. So we've got, what, Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu, um, Sailfish, and OpenWebOS. And they're all three of them have, have big news this week. So um, Brandon and I were talking about this pre-show, and I think, Brandon, you've got probably more organized thoughts than I do because I've just watched all three of these, or I've just gotten caught up on all three of these just before the show. So let's let's talk about it. I mean, what 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 excites us most? And Joe, I didn't mean to exclude you. Anybody? What excites us most about this? What always excites me about a new mobile operating system is that someone someone that had to be pretty smart or a group of people had to sit down and create new paradigms, new way of doing things, new way of new ways of thinking about mm-hmm. things. And it's it's very unnatural for us because we know the Windows Phone way, we know the Android way, we know the iPhone way. But to to have to like learn something new. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit of a challenge, which is why you know there's this Ubuntu for smartphone video out there uh, that that is about it's pretty long. It's 20 minutes, 20 only minutes, yeah. half of which is actually the phone, and you gotta kind of watch it a few times to get it, or else at first you're gonna say this is too different. I I can't I can't imagine how I'd ever want to use this. Um, <laughs> what what I think is most interesting about Ubuntu is the way that you switch. Apps like in in all of their operating systems. Do you guys use fast app switching a lot, or do you just kind of stay in the same app and go back to your home screen? Oh, I never go back to the home screen. No, if if there's a multitasking functionality built into the OS, I will use it. Like I will try and get that cards modality back that I appreciated from WebOS. Yeah, and and have you ever met somebody who doesn't know that they can they can use fast app switching and they always go back to the home screen like mom or dad? Totally, totally, absolutely. And and then you show them and you're like, look, you just double tap the home button or you just tap and hold the home button and look, you get all, you can see all your programs and they and they look at you like, why would I ever want this? And you're like, oh, why wouldn't you ever want this? This is the like, yes. this is this is the best way to be productive on yes. a smartphone. So anyway, the problem with all the all operating systems right now is that to get to the fast app switcher, it's behind an action wall. So on the iPhone, I think it's the, probably the fastest double tap. In Android, it's a tap and hold of the home button. Or if it's a Nexus device with on-screen buttons, you just tap one button, which is probably the best. And then in Windows Phone, it's a tap and hold of the back button. And in Ubuntu, it's a swipe from the right edge of the screen, which, which makes it real easy to go back to the previous app. The problem is the reverse doesn't work. If you swipe <laughs> from the left edge, you get a list of programs right. instead of going back to the previous app. Uh, if they were to fix that, I think it would be a, a not a revolutionary way to, to, to fast app switch, but one of the, the most fluid, efficient ways to do so. I completely agree. And that, I was going to say the same exact thing. Uh, Ubuntu uses the, the mobile app, uh, excuse me, the mobile platform of Ubuntu uses all four corners or all four edges of the screen. Uh, for specific gestures. It's a lot like Windows 8, in my experience, on, on the surface. Um, yeah. But it also has the same intuitiveness problems, where it, and that's exactly one of them. You swipe in from the left, and you get your, um, your, your recently used apps and stuff. And I like that, that it aggregates recent stuff into a list. But you, you swipe from the right, and it goes back to the previous app, which is wonderful. But then when you try and <laughs> duplicate that functionality by going over to the other side of the screen and saying, oh, okay, so I want to go back to the one I was at before I switch. Oh, wait, no, now I'm in the recent list. So it's, but you know, it's something that you have to, that I think you could get used to pretty easily. Um, but like you say, it would just take time. It would, it would take a learning process. Um, I wasn't turned on as much by their whole philosophical, the philosophical talk of like, we don't want a lock screen to like, to keep you from your apps because we think yeah. it's wrong to keep you from your apps. It's like, no, right. you just, I mean, you know, you're doing something different and I appreciate that. But lock screens have a real utility and that's to prevent your apps from going free in your pockets, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and then and then, so they they don't have a lock screen, and yet there's this like way you can unlock the lock screens. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. notice that? Yeah. You like swipe something, and then it like unlocks. And you... Right. So right. they really do have a lock screen. They just they they don't like using that term because you know it's too too common. <laughs> it's too yeah. Oh, yeah. It, Go ahead. Jack. What I saw there was instead of having a lock screen that has specific apps that you can get into that have to be specially coded for the the lock screen to be able to work or widgets on the lock screen or whatever. Uh, Their lock screen is kind of there, but you can get into other apps. It's a quick launch, basically. I want to launch this particular app, and it launches and unlocks at the same time. The security on that, I don't know. They're Ubuntu, so they're security heavy, and we'll see how that works. I'm I'm not sure. I do like how the, the lock screen or the... The, the front screen, whatever they call it, the facing screen, has this kind of, um, there's, an, there's a kind of circular 
animated pulsating light show that is um, it's not necessarily subtle, but it's not too flashy. But apparently, it changes over the course of your use of the phone, so it evolves to um, to kind of reflect you. Uh, there, there was a big push on the video. The guy was like, "It's like a fingerprint. It's like a." And by the way, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't mean to keep calling him the guy. Who who did who did the video? I feel underprepared. Do you know who was on? Who was the host of that video? It's that that British guy. <laughs> oh, oh, right. Okay. Well, I was right then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, it, it you know they, they say it's like this um, very unique signature. It makes the phone yours, and that's you know it's cool. They've obviously made some really big strides toward making a a unique and cool UI. They've brought back this kind of the just type. Um, experience from WebOS a little bit, where there's a persistent search bar near the top of the screen, like on Android. Um, but you know, and you can search the device and the web at the same time, which is nice. But it, there's there's a lot of new UI paradigms at work between the I, recently aggregated stuff. Go ahead. I'd imagine that this dial thing that you're talking about, where it can show you a variety of notifications. They have it showing how many tweets you have, how many messages you have, uh, what your how, how much talk time you've left. I imagine they're not going to keep that. Uh, because usually you want to see more than just one piece of information. And I guess it's going to learn that, like, first thing you do when you turn on your phone is you go to Twitter. So it's going to always show you tweets or your battery's getting low, so it's going to show you how much talk time you've left. But, like, what if you want to see your messages and how much talk time you've left? I, I, I think that that's going to be changed. You know what? And and maybe it'll be flippable, like that Motorola Circles widget that I love oh, so much. Oh, that would be neat. Or yeah. or you can, like, take your finger and rotate it around the dial. Exactly. And that's what it looks like you can do that. It, I mean, it... It looks like that, that functionality like that. is, if it's not built in already, it, it will be. Um, but it, there's a. It, it, I want, did you see the part in the video about the apps? I was I was about to to kind of talk about that. I don't like apps. Off. Apps are are first class citizens. <laughs> yeah. Well, HTML5 apps are first class citizens. Web apps are first class citizens. That's that's the breaking point. So yeah. So there's another thing with as far as apps go. Uh, the there's. Web apps, which are you know prioritized on on the new Ubuntu mobile, it seems, but they have tie-ins to the notification center. So as a result, they can control things like little envelopes in the status bar and stuff like that, which I think I, is unique, right? I've never met a web app that can can do that. I guess it, it's just a generic like notification service thing that should work on multiple phones, and I've never heard of any web app doing that natively on the phone. So I guess yeah. it's a new kind of API that developers would have to tap into. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I think that was cool. And actually, that got me pretty excited for a second where I was like, oh, wow, this is something new. What are they going to do? Because the, the whole question in my mind, and I think the whole question in anybody's mind when they're watching a new platform, uh, a video of a new platform is, well, what are you going to do about the app situation? Because that's, that's the question. You know, BlackBerry is going to do their thing where they run Android apps, and that's that's a really cool, you know, idea. Do we know if this can run Android apps since it's based on Android, right? Uh, you and I don't. Maybe w when we get Joe Levi back on the air, he'll be able to weigh in on that. Okay. Yeah, so the other thing about having uh, web apps as first-class citizens is, for example, I, I know there's a Wikipedia app, but I don't want to download it for some reason. I guess I... I don't want to be that smart. So what I do is I have a Wikipedia bookmark, and I go there often. I land there often on Google. If... If Wikipedia on my phone was treated like an app, that would mean a few things. One, I would see it uh, with its nice little Wikipedia icon in the app switcher, so I could switch more quickly to and from it. Two, its state would probably be saved. So whereas if I enter it from the browser, it's got to reload the page, and if, an, if enough time has gone by, maybe it's been kicked out by other browser tabs. If it's a first-class app, it never gets kicked out. And... Three, I can manipulate it more. Um, I can uh, put it into, in, in the case of Ubuntu, it, it hangs out in that little side thing in your favorite apps. Uh, you can link it in various parts of the operating system on your launcher, if, if this were Android that we were talking about. So there's a lot of really interesting advantages of having web apps as, as treated like applications. There are, and it, it's, and it goes beyond notifications, and it's really exciting to do that, and I was really excited because that's, you know, how I was like, oh, okay, this is how they're going to overcome not having an installed, you know, not having a, a pool of hundreds of thousands of apps to draw on. Um, but then there was this part in the video that I think they did their best to gloss over, where he was like, but, but web apps can't do everything, and sometimes you want a natively coded app. They're beautiful, and their performance is great, and they're great for games. And he's basically running down the whole list of everything we already know about why apps are important. And then he's like, and we've got a great SDK for that. And then they kind of move on. And I'm like, wow, really? Okay, so for, <laughs> for legit stuff that needs an app, 
you still are going to have developers are still going to have to code for now a fourth platform. That's the proposition here. I will shave my head the day when a new platform within the next five years comes around with an SDK and there are enough apps to cover all of your needs after a period of time. In other words, I don't think that even with this SDK, even with you know the openness of Ubuntu and the, and the name recognition, I don't think this thing will ever have enough apps to where we can call it a home. You know what I mean? Right. And yeah, I think it's so it's it's early to, to make any of those kind of calls. But I mean, that's my gut feeling as well, because I, I walk around with my Windows phone and I think about this this dev thing all the time. And even Windows phone, which is, you know, getting close to 200,000 apps, if it's not there already, I still get this impression that when a developer and Joe, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong here, when a developer is like coding apps and is like, OK, I got the iOS one, I got it to the Android one at some point, And then there's this kind of like. There's this deep breath, and it's like, oh, geez, and I got to do Windows Phone too. Mike, do I have to do Windows Phone? Can I get out of that? Let me wait until Microsoft throws me some money. You know, I, I feel like that'll only be exacerbated with a fourth platform. You know, well, so as as a web, uh, that's kind of the the all in one unifying language and unifying source information. Even the apps that we run on our phones are they're web fed. Instead of everything for the app. You know, the, the user base and whatnot from the web, they're getting all the data from the web. And that's not going to go away. We found, and, and this is kind of telling, and I think, it, I think it doesn't bode well for the web app as a first-class citizen model. Facebook made their entire app in HTML5. It, it essentially was just a, a container that was a, an Android app that consumed the H5 special mobile version of Facebook for the device, and they abandoned it. I wonder if, and, and I, I wonder why, uh, you know, the, in the Facebook situation where they used an HTML5 website, the performance wasn't good as uh, a native app. Was, that be, was it because the browser doesn't have good enough performance, or is it because native apps just have much, much better performance potential because they can tap into the hardware in a better way? Well, the, the reason is when you're talking about a native app consuming data, all you're doing is asking for that data. And the app itself controls the, the user interface. It controls the animations. It controls all of the, all of the prettiness that we think a native app should have with it. When you're using HTML5, still that limitation where it just doesn't look as good. It doesn't function as well because it's, it's lowest common denominator. It's got to work for everything. You're essentially running an app within an app, and that alone kind of makes it impossible to have. I mean, I wonder if when we have octa-core phones with seven, you know, 75 gigabytes of RAM, if if and if we go back to the Facebook Touch web app, if it would match the performance. I guess I guess it would, it would never because it, you know the the native app is still using those you know eight cores and 75 gigabytes of RAM. So okay, so let's 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 jump let's dive into that real quick before we move on to another platform. I want I want to ask. I want to just get that app question cleared up. I mean, Joe, we didn't get a really high-level view of your opinion on this uh, on the Ubuntu situation uh, because we were having technical difficulties. So from a UI standpoint and from an app development standpoint, what do you think the future of this platform is? Well, they're putting in a lot, a lot of eggs in the, the HTML5 app basket, if you will. And that's, that's not a good thing. We were talking about how Facebook abandoned the HTML5 tech that they had inside their Android app and went with a native Android app. And the reason behind that is when you're sending data to an app on any platform, you have a data feed. And that data feed is relatively lightweight. It's usually JSON, uh, JavaScript object notation, which is it's lightweight, it's fast, it contains the critical data, and it pushes that down to the device uh, or, or gets pulled down to the device, depending on the perspective. Okay. And it's just quick. Everything that happens with that data feed is all controlled on the device, in the app, and it's, it's native. It's quick, it's responsive, it's pretty, it's fluid. When you try and do that with HTML5, you can accomplish many of the same things, but... Because it is HTML5 and because you've got all of those web technologies involved, instead of just pushing the content down to the page, you're also pushing it, all of the, the user interface, all of the, the libraries, the JavaScript libraries, the, 
everything to make the app look and behave like you want it to, and that's never going to be as fast as a native app. You're not using native libraries. You're using this other JavaScript library, and you're running it through a browser. So like Brandon was saying, it's like running an app inside an app. And yes, it works, but it's kind of like working for the lowest common denominator. It's something that you do to make your your product or service look okay until you can do it right by creating a native app for it. Which And that makes a lot of sense of what you say, with looking okay. I mean, like, you, if you capture a screenshot of a web app or if you do a render of your new smartphone running, up, like, say, the Facebook web app, it actually looks really great. It's not until you start interacting with it and you start seeing that lag and, you know, the, the, like the, the, the page movings from side to side in the browser that you really realize that, like, well, I, I would really prefer a native app. And, yeah, and, and, and you're... the difference between native app and HTML5 app, and it's unfortunate that the experience isn't yet to the point where you can't tell the difference and not know what it is. You know where I'm going with that. If, if you can get to a point where you don't know if it's an, a native app or an HTML5 app, it doesn't matter anymore. And it kind of it kind of happened happened backwards with Facebook. I mean, if they did this in you know five years when phone phones had ten cores and you know 128 <laughs> gigabytes of RAM. You know, I think it would have been a different story. And this HTML5 thing is awesome because they don't have to go through any of the app stores to update their apps. They just push it live. Right. And and this it's the same exact experience across every device. It's great. But, that you know, I, I think that a lot, you know, I, I want to say that a lot of the hardware out there had trouble with the the Facebook touch experience in the in the browser, but like you take a modern phone, uh, like the iPhone five or the Lumia nine twenty, you go to touch.facebook.com, it's always slower than the native app. Yeah, um, I, I think that there are ways to fix some of that just through UI, and I don't mean fix web app performance because we've just covered why that's kind of going to be destined to be inferior for a little while. But you can, um, I think people will put up with that to a certain extent. Not much, but if you have a beautiful, not just UI, not just a, a pretty UI, but a useful UI that actually does make up for your lost lost time in web apps with saving you time in other areas, I think that's really important. And I think Ubuntu looks like it'll do some of that, particularly with its search bar and its, its almost Kindle-like obsession with what's recent. Because you can just swipe off and it's like, all right, what did I recently do? And whether you're talking about a book, a web page, uh, some music you were listening to, a person you were texting, like it organizes everything chronologically in, in one part of the UI. And I think that's, that's, that's compelling. That's something we haven't seen outside of a tablet, I don't think. And if we have, I forgot it. So it wasn't that great. So I don't know. I think this is, this is exciting. I'm a little more excited than I, uh, than I was when it, when it dropped. I think do the most exciting. You- Go ahead, Brian. I was just going to say that I think that one of the most exciting things is that within just, uh, I think, a few weeks, this is going to be available on the Galaxy, or uh, available to install on the Galaxy Nexus. The performance will be poor, but, like, that'll be fun, you know? Uh, yeah, no, but unfortunately, the downside is that the hardware won't be available officially running it until, what, early 2014. Um, that's loco. And that's really frustrating. Because uh, you know, <laughs> we have no but idea. We'll have octa-core then, right? And right. We'll have octa-core gig and seventy-two gigs of RAM, so it'll it'll run fine. Yeah. Any guesses on what company would say, "Yeah, I want to make a Ubuntu phone"? HTC, ZTE, would... Huawei. I I would I would, yeah, the HTC is an interesting thought because what uh, these these companies you know Samsung, HTC, LG, they all need to start thinking about diversifying because all of their eggs are in Android right. and some of them have a little bit in in Windows phone which I don't think is doing much for them at this point and you know I, I could see a company like HTC investing in in Ubuntu I don't know how the how it's set up if it's you know if it's even a for-profit entity but um, I could see an, an OEM getting an exclusive on Ubuntu and really pushing it hard and offering something different although I, I don't know what like the headline feature would be like what would the marketing message be right because windows phone is already doing the whole beautifully different thing they're already yep. pushing the angle of you don't you've never used anything like this and ubuntu would have to do something similar because i think that's their big value proposition it's like yeah you know if it were me and if it were just me off the top of my head uh, i would probably say something like you know they have to push it as not just different better different you know like not, it's not just different for the sake of being different this actually helps you out um, they could probably make a series of commercials just on that lack of a lock screen thing. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it would be, <clears throat> certainly companies have done worse. Well, well, let's... 
in their video, they were talking about, hey, this is the same operating system that you run on your desktop, that you run on your laptop, that you run on your supercomputer in your home, yeah, that is quote from the video. Right. And now it's running on your phone. So I'm just wondering how many people out there, first of all, are running Linux on their <laughs> desktop computer? It, it's and growing. Then, it really is. It is. Yeah. But then again, of those, how many are using Ubuntu? And of those, how many are then going to say, I want that on my phone? We're talking a very, very small percentage of the field if we go with the marketing message that was presented in that keynote video that, that we've got up there. Which it's, I don't think they should do. Yeah. It's, it's a cop-out, though, but it's a clever cop-out because Ubuntu on the phone is definitely different than Ubuntu on the desktop. They've had to introduce all of these new gesture paradigms and the way things are organized. It's not this it's not like you're taking out a little mouse and a little keyboard. Uh, but they <laughs> they really they really spoke to me when they, you know, had a bunch they had like a, a MacBook Pro on the screen and an iPad and an iPhone and said these aren't, you know, it's not the same experience and they had, you know, a, a, a Windows computer and then a Windows phone and said it's not the same experience but Ubuntu is like the same thing on a phone. But then once they got into it, you know, it, it sounded like the same thing that Apple did when they said, we made this new operating system. It's based on OS X, but it's made for touch. And and it's like, great, it's based on it, but it's incredibly, entirely different. It has nothing to do with one another, except for maybe the core. Yeah. Which, um, actually, let's do an interesting exercise. Let's think of... <laughs> We're never going to get out of the thumbs, right? Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Let's think of characteristics, words that can define a mobile operating system, like different, like Windows Phone, or beautiful, uh, like Windows Phone, or, um, <laughs> or, or flexible, like Android. Like Android. Or, um, or easy, like iOS. Yeah. And, it, uh, it, it, well, it used to be stable, like iOS, but now I think that that can be applied across all three. Right. Uh, yeah. No, like um, regimented, like iOS. But are we, are we sticking to positive ones, or are we just... Positive ones, like when I was thinking of it as natural, like it, it, it figures out how you want to, you know, interact. I mean, Windows Phone does that to an extent, but more intelligently, like, you know, yeah. this gets you. This would be, I mean, intuitive is really overused as far as UI design goes, but that would be a good, a good adjective for, for this once you get to know the gestures. So they haven't talked about this yet, but they have to because it's Ubuntu. Ubuntu literally means community, not just you know, community in open source and in, in working together, but as a whole, working together for, for the betterment. And I know I've got Ubuntu fanboys that are going to flame me because that's, that's a dumbed-down simplification of translating what it's supposed to mean, but stick with me. <laughs> it's, it's about making a product better together. The, and doing you know, it the, often. The, yes, quite often, and just continual improvement for the betterment of everybody, not just the betterment of, of you or them or developers or users, but for everyone working together. That's so that interesting. to sell this platform. That's so interesting because a lot of consumers have this, this like, this, this like grunge, this, no, 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 this, this anger, I think, towards all of these software companies who, who promise these updates, don't, especially in Android, but kind of in iOS, because in iOS, you really don't get software updates that are major, but once a year. But maybe Ubuntu could be the phone where you get, you know, monthly updates. Your phone is constantly getting better because of this community aspect. I think that could be a very interesting selling point. Oh, uh, well, yeah, but, but with the community working on it, I could see how that kind of pace would be sustainable, but I, how can quality control be accomplished in that amount of time? I mean, it, you know, I, I feel like it takes forever for updates to come out for a reason. And then even when they do come out after waiting for six months, it's like the first day. There's like a forum thread that starts up somewhere where it's like, list your bugs with the Galaxy S3 software update here. And it's like, it's already up to page 19, you right. know? So I, I, I would get frightened uh, about that. And I feel like, I feel like even a, a common user, the minute that that starts happening, they're like, all right, peace out. Well, well maybe, maybe that's the... Um that would be the trade-off. I mean, I'm sure, I don't know how Ubuntu works now, but I'm sure they have systems in place for quality control. So when a new update is pushed through, and I don't know how often the updates are pushed through, but when, when it's pushed through, it, it's it's stable and, and working pretty well. But, you know, there might be bugs, and people that use Ubuntu are totally used to that, and they're happy and fine with that because that means they get you know, constantly improving software. So right. maybe, maybe the Ubuntu for phones would be for a different kind of user that wouldn't mind that stuff. Um, but would want to constantly improve them. You know what has to happen? What has to happen with all these new platforms coming out is the, the, that needs to stop being the attitude. Um, and Brandon, I agree. With, I'm not saying I disagree with your, your view, but 
um, we are reaching a point where we can no longer say, I think, um, this new phone is going to be for a totally different kind of user because we're running out of kinds of users. And it's gonna, the, I think the, <laughs> the question is going to have to become, um, is this new phone for, for somebody's second phone? Because I think that's that's going to become even more common than it than it is right now. Because my Twitter handle is Captain Two Phones because I'm an idiot and I've always done it just as a hobby. I've always had kind of two phones because I like different UI interaction. But people carry two phones all the time for work and for personal. I mean, that's the most commonly cited uh, situation where people carry two phones. And I think that maybe if if this hasn't happened in a year or two, there's going to be a real missed opportunity on marketing and advertising departments to be like, you already carry two phones. Why not make your second phone one you really like using? You I know don't I mean? know. No, totally. I don't. Totally. I, 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 especially as landlines go away, you don't think that that'll be the case? I don't think. I, I think the a, a tiny little minute fraction of the population carry two, phone in, two phones. In fact, there's a recent movement to move away from that when the whole enterprise was doing BlackBerry and the personal was iPhone, and now enterprises right. are allowing you to carry an iPhone. I think the more relevant question, the, the more relevant point is mm-hmm. what's going to be your next phone, not what's going to be your second phone. And, and, and don't forget, most people uh, think it's crazy. You know, if you have two phones, you're paying for two data plans and two phone lines, and that could be ridiculous. Not if one of them is work supplied, because yeah, yeah, I mean, of course, work is allowing iPhones in. They're allowing Android phones in. What about the people who are who don't like iPhone? What about the people who don't like Android? You know what I mean? They want their personal phone to be something else. But I feel like, I feel like that's easier to do. It's easier if you have a house that you live in that you know you're not going to have to move out of. But you also rent an apartment on the side for whatever nefarious purposes you need. It's a lot easier to change. Your, your side apartment. It's a lot easier to move out of your side apartment into another side apartment than it is to move from your, your main house. Because, I mean, like, I, I, just, I just think that y- y- when you're asking someone to change the, the only phone they use, you're asking them to do the ecosystem jump and all that kind of stuff. But y- there's, there's, there's room in there for a, for a second phone pitch, I think. You want to... Okay, here's, here's where they're going to win. Ubuntu is about community and it's about people who want to do things their way. Mm -hmm. It's also about people who want privacy and people who want security. Now, take Android, take iOS, take Windows Phone and try and write an SMIME encrypted email. Now, a lot of you just glazed over and said, what is that? I do that for fun, man. I I know you do. (laughs) Manual. Manual control. (laughs) So, So... so for those of you who don't know S-MIME email, really fast, whenever you send an email, you're sending a postcard across the internet. That is the literal paradigm. It's not – when you send a letter to mom, a, a handwritten letter or a typed letter, whatever, if you do that anymore, you take that, you write it, you put it in a security envelope that has the security – printing on the inside so you can't hold it up to the light and look through it. You you lick that seal, you seal it shut, and as soon as that letter is sealed, it's a felony for anyone to try and open that and get at it other than the intended addressee. If you have a postcard that you're sending from Cabo, that just goes through and anybody along the line who's in the postal service or the delivery chain can look at your picture, look at your message, and, oh, okay, that's neat, you know, Brandon's in Cabo for the holidays, and send it along the line. They can read that. Emails are the same way. Any email today that you send goes out across the Internet, and anyone in the middle can read that. It's a postcard. S-MIME lets you encrypt that and, and essentially lock it up inside that sealed envelope and send it along the way. I can do that on my desktop computer somewhat easily because I know how. But on mobile devices, I can't do that. I can't encrypt stuff. I can't keep things private as they go to and from, especially with Gmail. I can't do that. Ubuntu, especially for phones, that's their selling point. You want privacy. You want security. This is your phone. Nobody else does it. Well, that's, that's, well, a, that's a solid be. point. Yeah, I, I never knew that at all. Huh. Well... <laughs> and all of a sudden, the podcast <laughs> takes an entirely different turn. <laughs> well, I think uh, I think that's that's good to know, and I think we should um, we should move on from Ubuntu. I think this was our first podcast talking about anything Ubuntu related. Is it the liquid U or is it not? Is it Ubuntu or is it Ubuntu or what? I've heard it pronounced Ubuntu. Ubuntu. I think that's right, and I apologize for calling yeah. it something. Else. Well, no, well, I I do not. 
I stand behind, firmly behind my mispronunciation, as I will later when I mispronounce three out of four uh, listener male names. Um, Just Ubuntu and everybody's going to be happy. Yeah, the, the U OS. Well, I think it was good that we, we covered it um, rather exhaustively, but we, we there are other platforms that, that also have been in the news this week, and we need to move on. And I know less about this, um, but the, the OS from, I'm going to say it right, Yola is how you pronounce it. Not Jala, as I think I said a few times in other podcasts. Uh, it, it, Sailfish has had a little bit of a hands-on treatment from uh, Engadget, from Miram Jouar, and uh, it also looks compelling as a new OS. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. These are the guys that split off from Nokia and took uh, kind of what they'd been working on with Migo to make a new OS, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's a similar in a lot of ways to Migo. Uh, but I, I, I think it looks... It's it's more easy to understand than than Ubuntu. How did we decide that? Was? <laughs> Ubuntu. 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 <laughs> um, a lot of double O's, I think, in in that. One if you were to do the Paul. Yes. So so, uh, what I like about Sailfish is that the way that it your home screen are apps, but it's kind of a combination between they can be icons, they can be widgets. Uh, or they can be kind of like a frozen state of your app, like the last screen that you were looking on. And I, I think that's a really cool way because, you know, you usually deal with, you know, you're, you're pretty much focused on apps when you're using a phone. Uh, another cool thing that it does is this top menu system with the gesture where you pull down from the top and you don't even have to select the item at the top. The magnitude that you pull down, the distance that you pull down determines which menu item is selected. So you can access these menus so fast by pulling down. Mm -hmm. And then it's got this idea, just to kind of go through one, two, three, then it's got this idea where you can take an image and turn it into your system theme where it changes the colors of the UI. It applies a background in most screens and blurs the background just the right amount so you can still see your content. I I think it's so much better thought out uh, than Ubuntu. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'd much rather spend some time with that based on what I saw in this video. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm looking at the, uh, the wiki article out at sailfishos.org, and the SDK makes it look like it's uh, a very much Linux-based OS uh, in the true Linux-based, not the Android Linux-based. Is, am I reading that right? I don't know. You may be. I'm not entirely sure. Um, okay, so if that is right, I'm looking at you know all of this crossover between what we just talked about, native apps and SDKs, for a mobile Linux that would be synonymous here. So there's a potential that we could have cross-platform between at least these two apps and uh, maybe even work together. You know, you write one app and run it in multiple places. Well, that's that's the dream, right? I mean, like that that would be incredible if that were theoretically possible. I just want a phone that runs every app from every operating system and I does. So do I. So so badly. You know, I would probably pay as much as I would like for for like a not like a car, but like a used car. I'd probably pay a, a couple thousand dollars. I'd probably save up for a little while for a phone that could run any app. So you're talking about the the VM OS, the 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 V phone. Wh- wh- what? The, the V phone OS or VM phone OS. What are you it's, talking about? Virtual VM. machines? It runs virtual machines. So you, it, you'd run everything on it. So it just, it, it, is it, does it do it well? I mean, that sounds tough on it'd, the hardware. It'd, it'd have to. Yeah, I was going to say, does this, does this <laughs> exist? Is this from the 24th no. century? <laughs> no, it doesn't exist. But uh, I also want it in a tricorder body. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so what's exciting to me about Sailfish is that, uh, and I, I, we can't talk about this as long because I think none of us are as familiar with it as we were with the, uh, the, the U word, um, is, is that it's based on uh, a UI that looks certainly, maybe not better thought out, but, you know, just different. It's, st- it's still different, but it looks a little bit more simple. It looks a little simplified. And it's still really focused on being beautiful. The fonts choices are really awesome. Brandon, like you said, you can take an image and use that image's color palette to modify your UI palette. I mean, like, you know, it's got some cool stuff, and it's got that fun stuff we liked from Migo with the notification panel off to the side and, you know, pulling down on the stuff. And it looks great. But I think this one, this is certainly closer to launch, isn't it? 
I'm kind of like mining the fact file right now to look for it. And it's like final product sometime in the first quarter of this year. Yes. So could be any day now. I know, right? I uh, I don't know. Are these guys going to be at uh, at CES? Did we find that out? They will be there, and we're trying to see what we can do about getting a meeting. Yes. So another CES plug for uh, for next week. If you've forgotten since the beginning of this podcast. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and it finally, just to close out the, the new platform uh, discussion, Open Web OS has, uh, continues to improve, and it has been ported now to the Nexus 7, which is kind of this giant, this culmination of an awesome desire on the part of the Web OS community for a 7-inch tablet, which was going to be realized by the Touchpad Go back in the day, the, the miniature version of the HP Touchpad, uh, which was canceled literally, I think, days before its full production was to, was to begin. Um, and the Nexus 7 is much sleeker, much uh, smaller device than the Touchpad Go was, was going to be. And it's really, really going to be cool to see WebOS on a 7-inch display. Unfortunately, it's still in alpha state, so uh, we've had this thought. I have, I have this ready. And everyone on Twitter, thank you so much for telling me uh, uh, repeatedly about this because you, you know that I love WebOS. And the minute that this exits <laughs> its, its alpha state, uh, we, I have a Galaxy Nexus, thanks to Jaime Rivera here in the Boston office. I also have a Nexus 7. I will, I will load that as soon as there's legit hardware acceleration and as soon as it's actually you know usable. And uh, the guys at the Open WebOS Project are doing a great job and they're making a lot of fun projects. I think my favorite part about this whole thing, excuse me, fun progress, my favorite part about the Open WebOS to Nexus 7 port was that it was apparently done largely by, uh, many people were involved, it seems, but it was spearheaded by a, a kid who was, uh, excuse me, a, a guy who was home from college on his holiday break. So the point Not is bad. it really didn't take that long. Yeah. Or maybe he's just a genius. Or it may, you know, maybe both of those things are true. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking both of those are true. We've got yeah. a lot of really smart people in the community. Yeah. Speak, speaking of the Nexus 7, a mm -hmm. uh, little thought, and maybe this is a nice segue into Android. Um, yeah, we saw I, new news. Go ahead. I am amazed by how people love the Nexus 7. Unlike <laughs> any other product... I think I've ever uh, seen released. I mean, people have put away their iPads, they've put away their 10-inch tablets, and they have, with open arms, accepted the Nexus 7 as their favorite device, and they use it constantly. Both of you guys use Absolutely. a Nexus 7 probably constantly, right? Absolutely. I love it. Yeah, it's it's my daily tablet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you know it would have been mine if I could get past the color saturation issue. But the the point the point is that. This has been a very, very popular device for, for Google and for, for Asus, and they're still sold out, last I checked, or maybe just a few days ago, they finally have some inventory. Mm -hmm. I can't wait for the next one, uh, because they're obviously going to fix the screen problem. Uh, that's, that's my best guess. And it's, it's not too far off now. This you know Summer last year is when we got the Nexus 7, and... Like I, I'm just trying. To, I'm sort of fantasizing about the, the ways that the, the new Nexus 7 could be better. It's going to be thinner and a better battery life, have a better screen, probably a higher resolution screen, and of course, it's going to have that awesome form factor. Um, so I can't freaking wait. I can't wait either. But you know, I am a little scared, and I'll tell you why. I, every time there is an improvement to a product that is like the Nexus 7, which is kind of built like a tank and it's got soft touch, and it's like you can kind of throw it around without feeling too much guilt because it's hard to scratch it because it's built like a like a running shoe or something. Um, anytime there's an, a move made to improve a product like that, it usually results in something that is, yes, thinner, but more also fragile. daintier. Yes, it's more well, fragile. Here, and it's, here's the thing. it's prettier. And you feel like you, you, you are going to be breaking it or you're going to be scratching it. Or you're going to be, and I don't want to feel that way. I want to be able to throw the thing around. Well, let, me, let me sort of put your fears to rest, maybe. Uh, one of the reasons the Nexus 7 feels so good in the hand and is so durable and built like a tank is because it's made out of plastic, which is cheap. They did that to keep the price low. The, and all Nexus devices uh, going into the future are going to be more affordable than not. And so it's, you know, that that bodes well if you want a, a device that feels about the same, that uses that, you know, soft touch plastic on the back and the, the, the plastic instructions. So I think they're going to stay with plastic instruction. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess the only substitute material that I, I think I would be happy with would be, uh, would be polycarbonate. And not, you know, not with the glossy finish on it, but something like HTC did with the 1X. I think that would be fun. But it would also be more slippery. So maybe I just, maybe just, we'll, we'll see. I can't wait until the rumors start rolling in either. 
Um, but we have a lot of uh, a lot of leaks on 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 smartphone lineups uh, in the Android section. And if we can, let's just power through these because these are all it's all kind of the same story, right? It's right before CES. Uh, some companies are getting ready to present. And we have leaks from three different companies, from HTC, from LG, and from Huawei. Um, I think for the record, none of these are from us. These were not our, our exclusives or anything like that. We were just reposting uh, leaks from other sites. Uh, and HTC has this list of, like, what is it? It's 19 devices, I think. Um, it's this massive bulleted list of code names. And I love hardware code names. There's stuff in here like Apollo, um, of course, Deluxe, Evita. Impression, knight like a knight in shining armor, uh, Monaco Opera. They're 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 um. Quattro. HTC's code names are especially fun because they get reused a lot in the developer community. People <laughs> refer to their HD two for the rest of time as the. Oh. As the. I don't know. I remember. I didn't have one. I believe that was the Leo. Was it? Yeah. So it, it, it's you know. I think and I think HTC sort of continues to do that not only because it helps them internally but it, it helps them in the enthusiast community because oh, people kind of like feeling like they're on the inside you know totally yeah it's it's just it's exciting to see a whole array of, of secret names like occasionally you get you know one will pop out and it's like you know oh the you know the Samsung spheroid is coming out soon what's that you know and, or like the galaxy frame you know but like look at like these are this is quite a list but I got very nervous when I first heard about it because I was like HTC is prepping how many handsets didn't they do this in 2011 didn't they saturate the market with a bunch of phones and wasn't it a big disaster but these we, all appear to be variants we've seen them do this before in the beginning of the year we see like 40 phones and they only release like a third of them <laughs> right and maybe you know that's probably standard procedure to to an extent but a lot of these are variants like four five six there's at least six or seven of these on the list are m7 variants and, and and some of them, I think, are contingent on the success of a, of a different device released. For example, I've seen the Quattro show up in HTC Leaks for several years now, and I bet that is their bigger tablet that they, they well, they did the Jetstream, but maybe a better, bigger tablet that they were going to make if if the Jetstream was popular or the, or the what's the one with the, the Flyer was popular, and they just never got around to it, so now it's just was bumped, re, the, the code name was reused. Right. Yeah, it's it, it's going to be fun to see what they uh, what they bring out at MWC, which I think is going to be um, it's going to be their big show. Um, and as, as I mean, I feel like we always talk about HTC in these kind of glowing terms, but um, we've also got LG, uh, which has I think more interesting rumors because we kind of don't know what to think about HTC's lineup right now, with the exception of the M7 maybe and the and the Deluxe. But LG is is rumored to be prepping. A, uh, a phone with a 4.7-inch screen with such a th thin bezel, according to a story that Anton wrote here, uh, at around one millimeter that we can basically call it a bezel-less device. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I was, uh, I was at the AT&T store this weekend messing around with the, uh, the LG Optimus G, mm -hmm. which I still think is the best phone on the planet right now and interestingly does not have the touch sensitivity issues that the Nexus 4 has. Um, <laughs> and I was, I was about to buy one, like buy a used one from, from Swappa uh, because it's just such an awesome phone. But then I had to like pinch myself and say, no, 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 there's going to be a 1080p version of this maybe with a bezel-less design very, very soon. And I had to close my browser. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I think they're doing the, the uh, maybe the, uh, this won't be branded as an Optimus G2 or something, but, the, you know, LG's on a, a little bit of a hot streak, and I think they can. And well, even if we look at the, the Nexus 4, you've got those nice rolled edges that I, if you haven't ever picked up a Nexus 4, I can't really describe it. it my description doesn't do it justice the the edges are rolled so it makes swiping left and right very nice very fluid very beautiful and it just feels so much natural than on any other device i've ever used can, can i ask you something about that joe absolutely is that really true like if you take if you pick up your galaxy nexus which doesn't have the rolled edges and you swipe and then you swipe on the nexus 4 do you really think that it feels that much more natural? I'm just asking your opinion. I have just now picked up my Galaxy Nexus, in fact, and my Nexus 4. I have them side by side for all of you in Radio Land. 
And yes, having a flat screen with there's kind of a, a, a bump edge on the Galaxy Nexus all around the bezel, so you know where the edge is. It's it's a, a rough start. So when I swipe, I want to start swiping just just inside that bezel, so I don't feel that rough edge. Um, but if I'm trying to swipe without looking at the device, I can't feel it. You know, I, I have to feel where that edge is to know where the edge of the, the device is so I can start swiping. Right. With the Nexus 4, I can feel that edge, and it's nice, and it's curved, and it's, it's gentle. It's not as abrupt, and it just feels so much nicer. I found myself just unconsciously swiping back, back and forth on my screen at times just because it feels nice. Just treating it tenderly. <laughs> treating it it's a it's like a woman it has to be caressed and i, I i'm doing appreciated. the same I, i've got the, i've got some, my nexus some, some men are into caresses joe let's, let's 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 open it up to all of humanity it's all right that, that's that's true yes. you've, got a, you've got a you know you gotta you gotta i don't know what you gotta do go ahead Brian. <laughs> uh, joe do you uh, do you since you have both devices in front of you is it me or is the nexus 4's glass a lot sl- more slippery smooth whatever you want to say than the galaxy nexus Oh, good grief, yes. Has to be. And on the front of the device, I don't mind that. But they have the same slippery liciousness on the back as well. And it does the and dance that, off the table. This is the that I uh, hate. Uh, I, I absolutely hate. This is the first thing that left on my mind when you brought up any, any LG products, when you brought up the LG Optimus. And it's not just LG, because, but when I had the Optimus G on AT&T, that thing would fall off tables. I talked about it a lot on the podcast. I talked about it in the review. The Lumia 920 does the exact same thing. It's got such low friction that if a table is anywhere near a, away from level, the Lumia is like sailing off into the distance. Just keep it away from tables. It was ridiculous. I mean, it's amazing. There are actually videos on YouTube of... There was an article. I think WP Central posted an article headlined, like, does your Lumia 920 do the funky dance? And, like, a video of, of the phone just sliding around on this table all on its on its own. That's I, hilarious. I, I think the next thing has to be, in hardware design, has to be something that allows the phone to be glossy if manufacturers want it to be glossy, but that doesn't permit it to just slide all over everything like a bar of soap in the shower. You know? Joe, has the, has the bumper solved the problem? Oh, absolutely. The bumper solves the problem, except you can't put the bumper in your, you know, in your holster on your belt because it's too big. And do you rock? So what do I, you rock your phones in a belt, Joe? Hold on a second. Do you, do you do the holster thing? I totally have a holster thing. Nice. Yeah, I, I am that much of a geek. <laughs> I love. I used to do holsters of, from like 2004 to 2008. Like if you had a Nextel phone, you had to do a holster, otherwise you, nobody took you seriously. <laughs> yes. It's, it's so you know, it's only half as geeky it's not this big you know vertical one strapped down my leg but, <laughs> but anyway um Go ahead. this is the only phone that i have ever used that has spent even though i'm wearing the holster on my belt that spends at least half of its time in my shirt pocket and whenever i'm wearing a shirt that doesn't have a front pocket like i am right now it, i'm at a loss i keep trying to put it in my front shirt pocket and I don't like to do that because whenever I bend down to, to pick something up or whatever, I'm afraid that this device is going to sprout wings and jump and throw itself against it the will. It, it absolutely will. Uh, but I, I want to talk if, while we're on LG and before we move on to, to uh, Huawei. Uh, there's another thing that gets me more excited about LG's rumors because a 5.5-inch LG phablet is also in the report with a, um, a full HD screen at 403 PPI. Um, and then there's a 7-inch tablet mentioned as well, and whatever. That, maybe that'll be cool, maybe it won't. But the, the LG, like, I think took the most visible and painful leap into phablet territory with the, uh, the view slash intuition. And that's why this, this phablet is interesting to me, because I don't think they're going to do that again. I don't think this is going to be the view 2. Or if it is, I don't think it's going to be named the view 2. I mean, do, do you guys think that they're going to go toward a more conventional form factor with this, or are we going to see another almost perfectly square piece of absurdity. I think LG woke up, and I think they saw the sales numbers from The View and the reviews from The View, and I think they're not going to do The View again. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And that, that's why I think it's exciting, because we know LG can do awesome stuff, because, you know, arguably the Nexus 4 is awesome, and I think the Optimus G is really awesome. So that'll be exciting to, to see. And I... I <laughs> I feel like somebody just assembled a, a dump truck. Really, who do, are you guys doing some file cabinet fun? I just decided to reorganize my desk. Yeah, just just hanging out. That's cool. 
he was looking for all of his LG products on the shelf right there. Right. But. I was looking. For, I was looking for my view so I could like you know use it as a frisbee. <laughs> it has no other function, functional value. Uh, and finally, now, is, is that because of its the the screen orientation? Is that why Have you is ever that? Held why? one, Joe? I haven't seen a view before. I. You haven't, you haven't well, been, I've seen it, but I haven't held it before. You haven't been Every, to the Verizon, Verizon Wireless store and had a look at the intuition? I avoid Verizon Wireless like the plague. <laughs> Go into a Verizon store and look at the view. It is like photos and videos don't do it justice. It is a very good example of strong but wrong as far as design choice goes. Like, I mean, it is bold, but boy. I mean, and Brandon, of course, you, you did the unboxing, so I shouldn't and be talking over you. The, the, the view's terrible doesn't stop with, uh, you know, a, a design that was too bold and inappropriate, but uh, you know, once you turn on the device, the, the screen quality isn't great, and the device is laggy, and it's using LG's pre-Optimus G UI, which is different, and it's terrible. And then it's so weird. Then the Optimus G came out, and it's like I kind of, and I think I said this on a previous podcast. I think I prefer LG the the Optimus G interface, the skin, whatever they have on it, versus stock Android, Cyanogen Mod Ten, whatever else. It's just so good. But the view is like the ugly, ugly duckling. Yeah, it is. So if LG were to uh, upgrade the OS running on that and include the the version, the skin that's running on the Optimus G, would that change your opinion? Would it be enough to change your opinion? It wouldn't because the hardware is just so incredibly cumbersome. Obviously, they, they, they imagined a world where people had hands that are as as big as you know dinner plates because you just you can't use it it's like it's so bad i i'm getting upset can we move on yeah (laughs) let's please let's 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 move on uh because we have another company and finally the company is huawei um (laughs) that was a sentence that that should only uh, that couldn't even a mother couldn't love um the, the the last company on the leak list was huawei and it looks like their renders are out for their their windows phone offering the uh w1 the Windows Phone 8 offering, packing a 2,000 milliamp hour battery. And it appears that it's going to come in white, cyan, pink, and black. And I really hope that these renders are, or photos are, um, like, I hope somebody turned down the saturation on these. Because the cyan is kind of like, it, it looks like what would happen if, if a budget crayon company made cyan. And the pink is a lot more like that awful carnation pink from Crayola than anything magenta. Um, the, the colors don't look very pronounced. What article are you looking at? I see white, blue, red, and black. That's not cyan, and that's not pink. That's, that's exactly, blue and red. Exactly. Exactly. No, completely. And uh, you know, I think the black and white ones look okay, but those colors, I don't know what. Um, I don't know. We could we could spend a whole a whole podcast talking about color. I just wrote a piece on the iPhone's color, and I, I just I'm I'm out of synonyms for color. Like when I got to the point of saying um, <laughs> spectrally diverse. I was like, I'm done. I'm, I'm, uh. I can't write anymore. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, th- th- these are the, the Huawei Windows Phone 8 device, and that should be um, that should be fun to see. I'm I'm interested to see what they'll do with Windows Phone 8. But we also have two Android devices: uh, the Ascend D2 and the uh, something else. I don't know. I lost it. It's I guess it's just the Ascend D2. Um, with a 1.5 gigahertz quad-core CPU and a 13 megapixel camera, which will excite anyone who doesn't remember that it's not about the sensor size as much as it is about the lens optics. So, uh, um, you know, I, I, uh, Huawei, I have, I have this hope for Huawei every time a, a show is on the horizon and we're going to see them, because I know they're kind of going to blow it out with their booth design, which is usually, like, huge and massive, and they usually have really knowledgeable people, and they're, they tend to be, I think, really overstaffed. There's a lot of people to help at Huawei booths, and that's great. So, I mean, they're obviously serious about this, and they're getting the, the rough treatment from the U.S. because of, you know, maybe, maybe legitimate intelligence concerns or, you know, State Department concerns. But Huawei is really trying, and they really, really seem to be serious about um, building their presence. And I think I saw a spec tweeted or something referenced where it says that Huawei's self-branded hardware production is up, like, a ridiculous percentage compared to last year. Like, last year, only 20% of the stuff they put out on the market was branded by themselves. Like, it was otherwise they were an ODM or whatever. And this year, 80% of their mobile products were self-branded, so... 
it's cool. It's cool to see a company grow like that. And I just hope some of these products are good because my one experience reviewing a Huawei phone was with the Ascend P1, and it was okay, but it wasn't really, you know, memorable. So is Huawei going to be the next HTC, do you think? Wow. The tip of my tongue. Wow. Bold, bold words. And between that and, and the Brandon saying before, uh, do you think that's really true, Joe? I feel like I'm on 60 Minutes all of a sudden. Uh, <laughs> you guys are hard hitters. I don't know. Is, it, is Huawei going to be the next HTC? I, I mean, do I think that they will have a stellar, a meteoric rise followed by a lengthy um, process of, of kind of increasingly saddening financials? No. But I don't, I don't, that's because I don't think that they're going to launch a, a skyrocket anytime soon that's going to be amazing. So the basis for my question was... What is it? You know, HTC was the, the secret powerhouse behind every cool device back in the day. Oh, I see what you mean. They're yes. the ones who designed it. They're the ones who made it. You didn't know it was HTC unless you really started digging into it. Right. But because they were man, they made some Box great stuff. UT Starcom or yeah, 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 yeah. Or, or Compaq or HP or right, yeah, whatever. Right, right, right. And oh. then all of a sudden they shed the, we're making stuff for other people and we're making our own and we're self-branding and look at this. And they had just like, to use your words, this meteoric rise. They, wow, they were great. And mm -hmm. then I don't know what happened and right. something sad and right. it makes me want to weep. Well, that's, so I see, uh, I see yeah. Huawei kind of doing the same thing. They've made, granted, not as spectacular as noteworthy devices for, for OEMs for a while and now they're going self-branded. But are they going to face the same challenges and the same ultimate... I don't want to say demise, but that's the only word I can think of that's right. that's facing HTC De right decline. now. Decline. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I think the difference in Huawei's case is that I've never seen, and maybe you guys can cite one. I've never seen a Huawei product that's like like blown me away and like knocked me over with its with its awesomeness, whether it's self branded or whether it's branded by another company. I mean, have you? I nothing comes to mind yet. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if if this one could be it. Yeah, I don't think it is. I, I, it doesn't look good. It enough. doesn't, no. And I mean, the, the other the thing that they're bringing... Looking, eh, like it could be something special, but... Right, but it looks like uh, the LG L9. Like, it looks just kind of like an unremarkable thing. It's a Me Too phone. Yeah, it's a Me Too phone. <laughs> and, and there's also a Me Too phablet, which is the last leak on this whole list, is this Ascend Mate uh, with a 6.1-inch display. And this seems to me the epitome of, of this kind of Me Too um, thing taken to the extreme where it's like, you know what, yeah, we got a phablet also, and look, it's giant. Like, 6.1 inches is ridiculous, and Samsung's probably about to do that too, and yay, well, whatever, we'll see. But um, that's huge. And it's 720p, and the battery is rumored to be 3,800 milliamp hours. So That's impressive. It's impressive. It's yeah, I mean it's cool, but you know it's not gonna, it's not gonna get my flag waving. You know what I mean? It's like okay, whatever. Apparently, neither is thirteen megapixels, but <laughs> no, about because the optics, so. it's exactly, about the optics. it's it about is the motion of the ocean. It is, it is indeed. <laughs> um, now that we got the leaks out of the way, I want to talk um, briefly. I just kind of want to. This is slotted in the rundown just so that I can give a little bit of uh, a, a, a punch in the arm, an encouraging punch in the arm, pat on the back. To our friend Joe Levi, who wrote a sweet piece about um, called Eight Scenarios Where Thanks. NFC Would Make Sense. Yeah, I love this. Because everyone always kind of craps all over M NFC and is like, ah, whatever, it's, it's useless and it's, you know, they can't make it work and whatever. And it has a like lot me. of challenges. <laughs> sure. I, I, I thought this was, I, I love this piece because, you know, I, I'm like the grumpy old man who thinks NFC is a waste of time and, and, and you know, thinking power. But Joe clearly outlined eight scenarios where I cannot argue that NFC wouldn't make life easier. My whole premise was that this whole idea of, you know, you, you get into your, you get, you get home and you tap your phone to change your phone profile. It's missing the point of technology. That should happen automatically. You can do it with Tasker and a lot of other situations. But all of these have something in common, and I, I want to figure out what that is. It's like you, you have a piece of, you have a credential that you need to present to something. And you don't want to have to bear the inconvenience of, like, keeping something with you. Is, does that make any sense? What do you guys? What am I trying to say? Yeah, I mean, you're you're talking about access based on, you're talking about very very easy access control, and the thing that spoke 
most specifically to me was something I do literally every single day. I go underground, I get on the train. And to do that, I have to pull my wallet out of my pocket. And if I were a real square, I would have to take out my Charlie card of, of my wallet and put it on the card reader so I could get access to the train. But I don't. I just slap my wallet against the thing, and the NFC or the RFID works through the wallet leather, and it goes. And that's what everybody does. But even that is so inconvenient when I have a phone that has NFC and the ability to store that information, and I'm just waiting on the transit authority to adopt that technology. Um, and that's I think about that literally every day. And I think about it further when I'm... I put my phone on top of my wallet when I put it on the table to protect the lens or to protect the screen or whatever. And any, any time the phone wakes up with a text message, it starts going crazy because the NFC element starts trying to talk to my Charlie card in my wallet. And I'm like, gosh, you guys, you, you guys are meant for each other. Please just become one. And th th when I saw that as I think item number one or two on here uh, on Joe's article, I was like, yes, absolutely. And, but then there's more. There's ticket stubs. There's business cards. There's... Um, you know, obviously the, the parking the, the meters is a good one. Parking meters is a good one. I never would have thought of that one. So, uh, how long did you, did you, this looks like something that you, you had to get off your chest for a while, Joe. Is this, uh, is this something you've been thinking uh, well, about? Well, we wrote quite a few articles about NFC and what you could do with it. We shot some videos, we did some stuff, we got a, a pretty good response, but everything kept coming back to what Brandon was saying. Yes, you can do all this stuff. You know, with with NFC stickers that you can buy for a buck and a half a piece. Yes, you can do this with key fobs, but they're NFC, and it should just know it and do it. So, how can we use NFC that's actually really useful now with technology that's available now? Yeah, we just have to roll it out. And so, this was I, I, Tony's probably upset with me because it took me about twice or three times as long as a normal editorial to write, and it came out a little bit later in the day than I would have liked, but uh, it, I, I feel somewhat justified in spending the time doing the research and coming up with some more use case scenarios that really aren't or shouldn't be that difficult to comprehend and to put into place and could simplify your life. I mean, even the, the calendar event and, and map and navigation locations embedded in your ticket stub, mm -hmm. I mean, that would be so much easier. The, the business card, that's a, a no-brainer. Let me tap yeah. a business card to my phone so I don't have to type it all in. Exactly. Yeah. And just as a, maybe a little bright point, one of your last points is the, is the Bluetooth pairing, NFC-initiated Bluetooth pairing, and we already see that uh, kind of in action here. And in my house, it's takes place almost every day when I tap my Lumia 920 to my JBL power-up dock and tell it to pair, and uh, it works very nicely. So maybe, maybe we're, we're closer to this bright new future than, uh, than we think. Well, let's hope. And, and the, the thing that I like from Brandon's takeaway is most of these have some kind of credentialing. Uh, they, they all focus around that. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the point I was going to with the, the Bluetooth pairing Every single Bluetooth I device shares one of like two or three codes, except for one, and that's my car. My car, you can put in any code you want. And what do I do? Well, I've got an eight-digit code, but that's still just eight digits. It's not letters, numbers, whatever. It's That should be pretty fast to hack, in, in all <laughs> honesty. Using NFC gives you the ability to use much, much stronger keys. And, yeah, you know, you've got the people who are going to say NFC is wireless technology, so it's hackable. We've seen that happen before. And, yes, there is that potentiality. But based on what we have now, which one is easier to hack? A four-digit code that's the same on every device or, you know, a 200-character GUID that rotates and is random? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I, I'll go with more security. Um, I, uh, I don't want to, to talk about this for more than 50 seconds, but if, for anyone who wants to read that piece, uh, listeners, you know where to go to read uh, the N Joe's NFC piece. And while you're there, you can have a click on one of our more recent videos uh, where I used the, the Galaxy camera as a, a daily driver for a weekend, which was an absurd experiment that was a lot of fun. Um, but barring any, any questions from you guys, we are butting up uh, against a, a time constraint here. And fortunately, there is not much room. There's not much news in Windows Phone or in iOS, so we can actually jump into listener mail. But uh, do you guys have anything you want to close out the Android section with before I go? I don't want, I don't, we're kind of suddenly pressed for time here. 
uh, I got something small for Windows Phone, and then I actually have to go. It's funny. I, I, we do these podcasts when Steven's in, and he, he's, you know, he's waiting in the other room. Uh, oh, I, d- I still all, ha- all lonesome. I still have yet to see the office. I would love to. I got to come visit the office sometime. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let's then. Then let's get out of Android. Let's jump into Windows Phone. And uh, the only thing that is actually newsworthy from this past week, and I don't even know if it was very newsworthy, was that uh, Nokia set up a Lumia 920 audio quality demo with this kind of rock guitar challenge with uh, the guitarist from uh, Billy Duffy. Uh, no, excuse me. His name is Billy Duffy. He's from the cult. And um, he played a guitar, and uh, he played this really, maybe a riff from one of the, one of their songs. I don't know. I don't listen to um, the cult. And uh, it was very markety. It was very PR-y. It was very advertising-y. It was, ugh, I, I don't know. It's not a very interesting piece. But basically, it just demonstrates that the Lumia 920 is the phone to have with you if you are videoing a concert. And please, just from me... Don't be one of those people who videos concerts. It's not fun. I don't like being behind you. I don't, I don't like watching the video you're capturing, which is awful jumbly and full of lens flares from the light action, and your, spe- you know, your microphone's going to be blown out, unless you're using the Lumia 920. But in which case, you know, please still don't do it if you're standing in front of me. <laughs> just, just don't. Just don't do it. Do it. I just, don't, so if you do, use, use the 920. But, but be careful because Michael's behind you and yeah, he'll punch you in the face. <laughs> don't ever do it. Um, anyway, that, that was a lame video. Please, Brandon, you, I think, had the opportunity to play with a 920 for first time in a while recently, right? <laughs> Yeah, it was the first time in a while. The last time I played with one was in New York where we really couldn't touch the phone. Right. Uh, and I've been so curious because you've been speaking so highly about it. And so I had, um, I had three observations. Um, the first thing is the placement of the power button. I love how it's so center, uh, cent- oh, what is the word? centered in the phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Right below the volume, uh, right below the volume keys, it's, it's right where the thumb naturally rests. It's in, yeah. in exactly the right spot, yes. Yes, very, very nice place on the power button. Uh, the second thing is I thought that this, w- what is that, the True Motion? Uh, true Motion HD f- Plus? Yeah, the, the, the high frame rate thing. Mm-hmm. That actually matters. Yeah. And it, you don't really realize it, but when you're on a regular kind of phone, you know, your typical Android phone or, or Windows phone, you're, you're flipping around and you're moving icons quickly. You can't actually see the icons while they're moving, which isn't that big of a deal because you're probably trying to flip past them to get to something else and then the screen stops and then you look at them. But, but in case that does matter to you, uh, the Lumia 920 does a really good job of keeping the, the icons readable while you're fl- flicking them around the screen. Yeah, I feel I was talking about this on New Year's Day actually over breakfast with a friend of mine and we were talking talking phones and uh that frame rate thing. It's I think it's akin to watching one of the new like the Hobbit in 48 fps. Um, I was just going to go there. <laughs> were you? Yeah, like I mean I I but I feel like a lot of people hate that because they're not used to it and I don't think almost anyone hates it on the Lumia because it's like it's it's just so smooth, and I didn't even notice it. I'll be honest with you. I didn't notice it for the first couple of days. It was only when I started using the Nokia Lumia 9, uh, 810 to review it that I was like, why is this a little bit... Like, it's not jagged. It's not bad. It's just... It's a little worse, though. Why is that? And then I was like, oh, right, because it's like almost half the frame rate of what the Lumia 920 is giving me. Yeah. So, yeah, you do notice it. So that is darn interesting. And then the third observation is... Something I really didn't pick out from the pictures. I like how the top bezel is thinner than average. And then the side bezels are about average. But then the bottom bezel is just huge. And I, <laughs> yeah. I don't like that because the, the screen is not centered in the face of the phone. No, it's not. It's just uh, me no likey. That. Well, you, you know what's nice about it? And I understand aesthetically why you would make that complaint. Um, what's nice about it is it gives additional room below the display um, not only for the buttons, the capacitive keys below the screen, but you get like another mm, almost an inch of space below the buttons so that if you're playing a horizontally inclined game or if you're just browsing something in landscape mode or whatever, you Can don't hit those damn buttons all the time, which is what I was doing, I think, on the Lumia 900, though I could be thinking wrong. I was playing Rise of Glory, and I was flying around, and I would hit that damn home button every time, and I'd jump out of the game. And on this, that on the 920, it never happens. So it's nice to have a little a handle there. But That's interesting. I mean, the Nexus 4 is the same handle, which I, I love. Uh, I guess the, the Nexus 4, even with the handle, isn't 
as tall as the 920 mm. with the handle. But anyway, interesting phone. When we're at CES, I want to have some more fun time with the, with your 920. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to have a device exchange. And maybe I'll finally get my hands on a Nexus 4. That'll be fun. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring a Nexus 4. Uh, gents, I'd love to stay on and talk more, but I actually have to go now. All right. Well, uh, Brandon, it was lovely having you on the air, as always. Brandon, tell everybody where they can reach you on Twitter. At Brandon Miniman. Very, very easy to remember. And uh, the next time you and I speak on the air, we'll be at CES. So I will talk to you then. Yeah, definitely. All right. Have a good one, man. Say hi to Stephen for me. All right. See you guys. Thanks, Thanks, Brandon. I just want to hit iOS real quick, and then I want to jump into listener mail. Are we cool with that? Dude, the Android guy talking iOS, what could go wrong? (laughs) Uh, Apple is already apparently testing iPhone 6 and an iPhone 6 uh, with iOS 7. This is a story from January 2nd. This is just yesterday. Um, yeah, I mean, th- th- I think this story prompted the usual. This came from Cult of Mac or it came from TNW, the next web, and then it was via Cult of Mac. Whatever. This prompted the usual backlash um, from Twitter uh, full of people kind of snarkily replying, Really? Apple's testing the next iPhone? I'm so surprised. The interesting part is going to be the iOS uh, 7 platform, which uh, who knows if it'll launch with this thing. The main question I have for the iPhone next, whatever they're going to number it, is are they going to make it more or less flexible? Because we've seen the curved iPhone displays already. I want to know are they gonna are they gonna go towards that or are they gonna rigid it up so that it doesn't bend like we've seen? Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, the, like the the back pocket iPhone five exactly. bending action. You know what's crazy is one of those listeners. If you don't know what's happening, you can bend the iPhone five really easily. Apparently, like without breaking the screen, which is crazy. Or anything. It, it looks like it's just this nice ergonomically shaped device to yeah. your face. I'm talking to your face, not to your butt. Get your right. minds out of the gutter. <laughs> no, it, it actually doesn't look bad. First, I thought, no, this is a Photoshop render. Somebody just bent an image of the iPhone 5, and this is whatever. But, I mean, if that is indeed true, I, I, that looks like a viable design for an iPhone. It reminded me of what? The HTC Cha-Cha slash, um, <laughs> you know, what was it called in the U.S.? The HTC... Uh, the Facebook phone, you know. Yeah, there was the cha cha, and then they had to change it to the cha 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 for Spain or oh, something. Oh, that's that. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it looked like an HTC cha cha, except it was an iPhone five because somebody sat on it with it in the back pocket. But um, whatever, we'll we'll see. Uh, we'll see if that's interesting. I don't want to talk uh, any more about it. And uh, and there was an iOS bug that resulted in in uh, Do Not Disturb being stuck on. And I like Apple's response to that because it was a January first thing. It was a date fueled bug, and then Apple was like, "Yeah, um, that'll fix itself on January seventh. So, sorry." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will take care. It reminds me of the uh, what was it? The the bug that they had with the uh, the date issue with the the old Zunes where. They didn't play on on New Year's Eve because it was a leap year, and oh, there no. can't be more than 365 days in a year, so you just can't play anything. So shut down. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's funny when, when bugs happen to smartphones because they, they affect the clock functionality pretty often. And i got to tell you, I don't know how how hard it is to code an alarm clock that works right, but it's probably more difficult than most things you can do. Uh, like you can build for a smartphone OS or for a computer for that matter. Right now, I have a MacBook Air where I have a third-party alarm that doesn't go off when the thing is in standby. <laughs> so if the screen is off, the alarm doesn't go off. I have a Microsoft Surface with a third-party alarm app that doesn't go off, period. <laughs> and I have, I have a bevy of Android phones, only half of which kind of reliably sound, sound the alarm. So I'm like, how, why is this so difficult? I, I don't understand how a clock... That 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 gets that goes off at a specific time is a difficult thing to build. Okay, so you've got two things. One is we're all very very concerned with battery life, and various manufacturers are playing around. Uh, you mentioned it in your uh, in your uh, camera phone <laughs> video, which by the way that was epic. My phone camera uh, video. Thank you. Yeah. 
Oh, that was so awesome. I thought it was just a gimmick, but it's not. It was wow. If you going back to that, if you haven't watched the video yet, it's not a gimmick. It's a legitimate experiment and it you owe it to yourself to watch the video. I loved Thank it. You. There's there's even a little Joe Levi cameo in there I saw. Thanks for that, Michael. <laughs> no problem. So, You're welcome. <laughs> but so <laughs> All these different manufacturers are trying different ways, uh, and with Android especially, it's not just Google and the Android OS. It's you know, people who are writing drivers for the devices, you know, the, the chips and whatnot inside the device, as well as the device itself, as well as the overlay to the OS, to try and make that sleep deeper. The deeper the sleep is, the, the more less power is, yeah, is going to be consumed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You get more battery life. Mm -hmm. But when you do that, stuff like the real-time clock becomes less real-time and less clocky. And you've uh, sometimes you've got to turn on the device and wait a second or two for it to realize, oh, crap, time oh, has passed. This is the right time. Yeah, that, yeah. It's this time. And at times, I think that even has to go out and negotiate with the, the cell phone tower to say, so to hey, hey, buddy, what time is it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and just figure out and, and, and present it. Right. So, yeah, there's, there's something that needs to be dealt with and, and handled there because the clock should be up to date regardless. How much would it take to just put a simple you know, watch technology in there, you know, a, exactly. a quartz crystal just to keep <laughs> just accurate to keep time. Watch going. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that shouldn't be too tough at all. We've got more high-end technology than that. The second issue is programming. And again, speaking as a developer, I'm less concerned about the middle use cases as I am concerned about the edge use cases. Uh, and for you non-programmers, non-techie guys out there listening, when I was a kid, my mom had me sweep and mop the kitchen floor. That was one of my chores. And I noticed something interesting. When she came to check and make sure that the job was done right, she didn't look at the middle of the floor. Ah. She always looked at the edges. Mm -hmm. She looked around the edges. Because if the edges were clean, the middle was clean. Mm -hmm. But if the edges weren't clean, I had to do the whole thing all over again. The same thing goes with programming. Find your edges, and there might not just be two edges. There might be several. It might be a polygon shape or whatever, you know, theoretically, metaphorically speaking. Mm -hmm. But you find those edges, and then you develop test cases to test those edges and make sure that your code works all the way to the edge. Because most of these problems are one-off problems. The Android missing December bug was a one-off problem. Do we start counting at 0 to 11 to get 12 months, or do we start counting at 1 to 12 to get 12 months? Right. Is month 11 November or December? It depends on where you start counting. You, you, you set up those, you find the edges and you set up those tests, and it, it solves a whole bunch of problems, but it takes more time up front to, to find that out. And when you're under the gun to get something out on a deadline, You've got management who says deadlines are more important than quality, and then you get into the, oh, we'll just fix it with a patch, right. which we've seen in Android is not the best <laughs> the best way to go about doing things because that patch so, may never come. So you're saying that it's, it is, in fact, much more complicated than, than we think to, to code something as simple as an alarm clock. Fortunately, I think the answer to that is probably yes, but you know, it's... No, that, that's a worthwhile reminder. I mean, that is, it is worthwhile to remember that we are all carrying very, very complex machines in our pockets, even though they are now ubiquitous in, in the first world, and in the first and second, and even parts of the third world. So, More so, just to tangent on that a little bit, third world countries, it's so much easier to put up a cell phone tower running you know, with one backhaul, and then people can get cellular data or cellular voice or both for miles and miles and miles around, they don't even have to have electricity at their house, let alone a phone line to their house to use their cell phone. Charging it then becomes interesting, but right. But cell phones, I think, specifically are are more helpful and and should be more prevalent in third world countries than we have them over here. They're of much more value and utility here for us. They're just secondary. We've got everything else, right? We don't need anything more. Right. Good old copper. Anyway, sorry about the tangent. Let's That's all right. That's all right. Well, we we can't. It, this is where I would end the podcast, right? Normally, um, but we absolutely must look at some of this listener mail because I want to start off 2013 with you know right and listening to listener mail. So everyone who is asked if we would do ever do a two hour podcast, 
The answer is yes. <laughs> just <laughs> hooray. This is your, your gift for the new year. No, we're going to actually, I really want to blaze through these. Um, and not because they're bad pieces of mail, but because um, some of the answers are great. And if we don't get to one of these, maybe we'll get to one of them next time. But I want to ask, because we have Joe on the air, we have a uh, first time write in from listener. It's always, <laughs> I know it's, I know it's my fault. I know it's, I know it's because I have not studied enough foreign pronunciation, but I can never pronounce names. It's pronounced Martin. <laughs> oh, Martin's Martin's number two on the list. Number two. Uh, this is from. I'm just gonna try my best. Dushyant Shrikhand. I completely massacred that. But uh, Dushyant, thank you for writing in. Thank you for letting us know on Twitter that you had written in. We can't address all of your points. Uh, I want to reiterate for 2013 that when you write in, please. Do your best to keep them uh, brief, but uh, we will try and, and maybe get to some of your additional points on a future show. Uh, but this is the most interesting one, particularly as we have Joe on the air. Dushant asks, do you think Google has just used or rather misused the open source community for its own profit as far as Android is concerned? I'm asking this because some people feel that Google has simply used the developer community and not given back to it, so to speak. That's an awesome question. I have no idea how to answer it. I can see the basis for that question, and I think there is growing sentiment in the developer community that that may, in fact, be the case. Mm -hmm. Um, That having been said, Google has provided us with the platform. They have provided us with the user base. They have provided us with the market or the Play Store now to to make that platform a a viable competitor. you know, definitely a, a second place, if not a first place competitor to iOS. So from a development standpoint, developers may be sitting back saying, I don't think Google is giving back as much to the Google project, uh, the code base, as they would otherwise have liked. But when you step back and look at the ecosystem as a whole, I think Google has done significantly more than their fair share. Uh, you know, Google... They're not a development house, first and foremost. They use development to accomplish their ends, whether that be you know, distributed web serving, which, believe it or not, is a, a bigger deal to Google than, than just search, because without that distributed computing setup and the custom operating systems that they have to, uh, to power that search, your search experience would not be at all what it is today. Um, so first and foremost, you know they're they're doing distributed computing and cloud-based computing. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're also a, a search engine who has all this other stuff. Without that framework, without that infrastructure in place, we wouldn't have the Google services that we have, and Android would be less uh, less viable as an alternative. Let alone arguably the number one, number two out there. So look at it from a a stand back and see the whole ecosystem standpoint rather than are they just contributing enough code? And I think the the answer then becomes evident. That is a much better answer than I could have given. And I can do nothing but say, Joe, I, I am compelled to agree with you because it was very well argued. Uh, I, I would like to bring up this conversation again in the future because I think it's a very interesting one. And thank you for bringing it up. Um, listener, but this ties in uh, to the last piece of listener mail that we're going to deal with. We have actually two more in the buffer for next week because they were great questions. But Martin, I'm actually going to hold your piece. And uh, also um, the gentleman from China who encouraged me to just call him Neo because he knew I wouldn't be able to pronounce his name. Neo and Martin. Morpheus voice to read the email. (laughs) What if I told you? Um, But Martin and Neo, we will uh, get to your mail pieces, maybe not at the CES email but in a podcast, but in a future one. I'm down to 15% battery, so we have to wrap this up, though. And I want to wrap it up on a tangentially related piece of email from uh, our old friend Khalid Amswaya, uh, who asks, he's been wondering about the application of the App Store, Google Play. Like Viber, WhatsApp, Tango, and Adobe Reader, they have no ads or any encouraging paid services, yet they're beautifully designed and supported. How do they get the profit? And this is a question that I, I run into kind of often. And, and, you know, when it's a service like Google, uh, which we were just talking about, yeah, they can, make a, they can write a Google search app and they're delivering, they're serving ads, they're getting more eyeballs on their content and whatever. But how do some of these companies that just seem to be ad houses make a profit on 
uh, like Khalid says, does Dropbox paid services pay up for millions of, of free accounts of free storage, or is one dollar yearly enough to keep WhatsApp servers running smoothly? I mean, I, I don't understand how some of these houses make make their money. You know, I I don't either, and I'm afraid. Um, I'll go back to what I tell my kids. Whenever you see something in the market or the Play Store or iTunes or on the web that is free, it's probably too expensive. <laughs> because free is seldom free. It, it costs you something, whether that's money out of your pocket, whether that is time to complete surveys so you can download something, or whether that is them collecting your demographics and usage that then they can turn around and sell to someone who then can market to you, uh, or some combination of all of them, it usually is too much money to go with free. And I would much rather spend even four bucks on an app to get an ad-free version that doesn't do that stuff than, than I would an, an ad-based version. Um, another yeah. thing is they could just be trying to get their name out there. And right, it could be a brand-building thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. The, the app itself is their ad, and then down the road, they then either uh, make a light version or turn that into a light version, which is free, and add extra bonus features, kind of like Evernote has done. Yeah, uh, and or, I think what we're cracked, the, the internet comedy site cracked.com, yes. I think, for Windows Phone 8, just has a, a, a light app right now, or for a while, they just had a light app. And then, you know, later on down the road, they'll roll out the paid version. Yes. Yeah. So that that's true. That's true. It might be a multi-stage thing. But I like your, your broad advice up front there, Joe, because it, it it's like some advice that I got at my college graduation party from an old crotchety friend of my father's who's like, well, you know, Mike, yeah, you, well, you know, there's no more free lunch. I, I mean, not that you were getting a free lunch, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Say it again. Like, say, what? Say, say it again. What? No, anyway, don't. Never mind. You'll it's good me. advice. It's good advice. And, um, Guys, thank you for writing. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the listener mail in this episode. We had some technical issues. Uh, Joe is broadcasting from the other side of a, of a subspace distortion today. It's and, bizarre. Uh, even Brandon was having some connectivity issues, so maybe there, there may have been pipe problems on my end. The tubes are all fouled up today, but we have to, to wrap it up. So we're sorry for running a little long. Before we go out, and I know we've got super yeah. time yeah, 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 yeah. crunches, I do have some breaking news. Breaking and news. The, Breaking news that by the time the podcast is out, it's going to be hours old. But uh, I am a supporter of a Kickstarter project for Ooh. the Pebble e-paper watch, yes. which was supposed to be released in September. And then we were, which by the way, that was my birthday present to myself. And then it didn't happen. So I'm a lousy gift giver for oh. myself. Um, it was supposed to be out for the holidays, but then they did the empty box thing where they gave you a card to print out and it had a rhyme that says, I promise I got you a watch, but it's not here, so sorry. Right. Uh, email just came through, says uh, uh, project update number 27. It's, it's almost, parentheses, almost time. time. Did you get the same one? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Oh, Pebble at CES. Pebble at CES. They are going to have a uh, press conference January 9th at 9 a.m. Pacific time, which I bet will be the announcement of availability of Pebble. Yes, that is awesome news. We've written about Pebble on the site as well. I have two articles uh, focused on on the Pebble project, one on the project uh, product and one on the project. So uh, look them up at pocketnow.com if you want to read more on those. And Joe, I didn't know you were a backer too. So it's you, me, and uh, a friend of mine named Chris. So they, oh, great. We're going to be able to pool our resources. Awesome. Yeah. I, yeah. Wait, what color did you get? Uh, I got black. I didn't, you know, it's such a, what did you get? I, I, I did as well. I was debating between that or gray or orange. They look nice. But, yeah. It was, you know, it's just that it, everything. even though it's small, it's still a pretty high profile device. It's not a pretty watch. I mean, it's, it's really, it's really not very pretty. Um, so I wanted black to kind of minimize its very pronounced bezel. Right, right. Uh, but anyway, we, uh, we, that's great news. Thank you for bringing that in, Joe. And, uh, and thank you for being on the podcast today. I'm Always glad nice I to could be here. here. Despite the uh, subspace distortions. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Um, 
And I think with that, we're going we're gonna to close that. Listeners, remember that next week we will be broadcasting from CES. It'll be Brandon Miniman, Jaime Rivera, and myself. Uh, maybe I will learn how to roll my R's by then. I doubt it. But, Jaime Rivera. Jaime Rivera. 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 But that wraps it up for this first episode of 2013 on the Pocket Now Weekly. Involve us in your conversations on the Internet. Brandon Miniman, as he told you, is at Brandon Miniman on Twitter. Joe is at Joe Levi. And you can find me at Captain Two Phones. You can also follow Pocket Now officially at Pocket Now Tweets on Twitter, Pocket Now on Facebook, and Google Plus. Leave us a review on iTunes or Xbox Music, if you will, because that helps us out a bit. And if you have a topic, question, or suggestion for the podcast, like the awesome questions we had today, or you just want to say hi, please email us, podcast at pocketnow.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you later. Good day. Uh, or 5S, whatever it's going to be. I think 5 it's, plus plus. Exactly. I think it's going to be a, a, re, a warmed over 5 with new um, software, with new... Uh, ugh. Ugh, I hate talking. Sometimes talking hard. Uh. <laughs> <laughs>